coming up today on Keys to Kingdom Living. God will fight the battle and we will possess the land. Now, you'll remember, here's the part that the Lord gave me. You remember they did not want to go in because their cities were fortified and there were giants in the land. And they said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers, and so they saw us as grasshoppers. What, what God showed me is that David is showing, God is showing us through David that we are well able through Christ to take the land, not be intimidated by the giants that are in the land, not by their threatening voices of what they're going to do to us and how we are uh, mentally ill because we hear Jesus speak to us, but we go ahead and do what God has told us to do. All the Jews had to do was heed the instructions of Joshua and Caleb, and they would have well taken the land out of, uh, from the way the giants and, and entered and possessed the land of promise. You see, it was God who put the boldness and courage in David's heart, and it was God who put the boldness and courage in Joshua and Caleb's heart to take the land. God has not forsaken this generation. He has raised up Esther's, Joshua, David's, and Ruth's that will refuse, that refuse to cave in to unbelief. They have, uh, they have dominion faith, and nothing can stop them unless those who follow refuse to go under the Lord's direction. I bring you greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Keys to Kingdom Living. God has given us a new word. It's entitled, Taking the Land. We began the first segment of it last week, and this is the conclusion. I want you to get out the word of God. Go with me because I love to back up everything that I preach out of God's word. And let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the church about us taking the land for him. The, the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this thing, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. You shall desire, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and told you shall eat it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face. You shall bring, uh, eat bread uh, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now we know in Isaiah 14, we're told that Lucifer rebelled against God and declared that he would exalt his throne above the stars of God, right? Right? Yes. Satan believed in the garden that he had forever thwarted God's plan and purpose for mankind because, uh, by causing man to sin. Now, I want to take it slow for a second. Satan did not go in there just to trip Adam and Eve up. He could care less about Adam and Eve. He went in there to get Adam and Eve to abort God's plan from being carried out in the earth. And when he got them into sin, he says, I've got God. I've messed up his only avenue of getting his will done on the earth. It was a big day for him. Now, what Satan did not know you can't get an upper hand on God. I don't care how slippery you are. What Satan did not know is that God had another plan. It was a secret plan that was already in place that was unfolding at the same time that God was prophesying over Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 about the creative plan 
and that they would have dominion on the uh, earth. Now, God's other plan is called the plan of redemption. So you've got God's creative plan that is written in the word of God. You have God's redemptive plan that is not yet revealed but is in action in Genesis 1 because it says in Revelation, I saw a lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the earth. So while Satan thought he had aborted and caused God's plan to be aborted in the earth, God had another plan. It was not a backup plan. It was the intended plan. It was the intended plan because he knew that man would fail. And so God activated, invoked, and started the redemption plan because whenever Adam and Eve sinned and he pronounced the curse over the earth because of Adam's sin, God then went and did what? He went and found an animal. He sacrificed. He killed that animal. He shed its blood. He took the skin of that animal and covered their nakedness. And in that was the plan of redemption beginning to be revealed. God help me. This tells me that there is absolutely nothing that Satan can possibly do to ever stop God from carrying out his plan on the earth. Satan tried, but Satan failed. Satan would have been better to have left Adam and Eve alone and let God do what God was going to do in the beginning. Now because he has done what he has done and caused man to fall, God has, inact has activated the plan of redemption, which is greater than the plan of creation. <sighs> Romans 8 talks about that the, the, the law could not be kept in that it was weak through the flesh. But God sending his son in the likeness of man, God. the creation plan involved man. But the redemption plan, it involved the incarnate God in flesh. Satan could have stopped Adam and he did but Satan cannot stop God when God is incarnate we've got to get God inside of us so that we can understand it, through Christ I can do all things and Satan cannot stop greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world I'm going to keep preaching this till it becomes reality we are under a better covenant than Adam than even Abraham we are under the covenant of Christ and through Christ we can get it done and we will get it done there is no if ands or buts this word is going to get fulfilled every jot every tittle is going to come to pass and Satan will be destroyed he will end up in the lake of fire now look there in numbers chapter 13 Moses has led the people up to the Jordan River. They're at the brink of going into the promised land. Instead of going on in, they send out spies to spy out the land. They're gone 40 days. You know the report. They come back with the evil report. Ten of them do. Joshua and Caleb come back with a report that is of faith. Numbers 13, 26. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran in Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified. And very large. Moreover, we saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell in the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession. Here it comes. For we are well able... To take the land. 
See, it's what you believe that will determine what you do. Believe the Lord and you shall be established in your land. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper in the land that the Lord has established you, right? We are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we, looking at the things in the natural. And they gave the children of Israel an evil report of the land which they had spied out. Now, for a long time, the Jews knew that God had a promise to give them their own land. God told Abraham to walk the circumference of the land and he would give the place where he, his feet walked. In this story, God was giving the Jews their opportunity to take the land and possess it for themselves, but they allowed unbelief to prevent them from advancing. Unbelief will keep us from advancing spiritually and taking the land. Now, this was their golden opportunity. This was that generation's golden opportunity. And the only one this particular generation would be given to take the land. Both Joshua and Caleb were like Ruth. They didn't allow seemingly impossible circumstances to cause unbelief to fill their hearts. They took God at his word because they had faith in his word that it was the truth. Right? Right? It's the truth. It does not matter the circumstances of the land. It matters what God has said. He has given us the land. It doesn't matter if there's giants in the land. If God says we can take the land, then by God's grace, we're going to take that land, right? Amen. Only that God had truly given them that land of promise to possess. Now, look there in Hebrews 3. We see that they uh, heard the report of the unbelieving spies, and they received it. And so they did not go in and, and possess the land. Now, Hebrews 11, I mean 3, verse 7. <clears throat> Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you will hear his voice, hear his voice, hear his voice, not my voice, his voice, and do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart for they have not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, here it comes, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, just as Adam and Eve allowed unbelief to prevent them from taking dominion over the earth and possessing it, the Jews who were under Moses' leadership all died in the wilderness and never received the promise of rest, including Moses. Moses never got to enter the promised land because he sinned against God, right? Right? But their hard-heartedness and unbelief did not stop God. Hear what I'm saying by the Spirit. It stopped them. It stopped Adam and Eve from fulfilling God's will. It stopped Moses and the children of Israel from going into the promised land and entering his rest. It stopped them, right? But it did not stop God from giving the Jews the promised land. Now, uh, President Truman, in May, I believe it was May 14th, 1948, I wasn't around then. Am I right? Acknowledged Israel as a state, as a country, as a nation. Seventy years later to the day, President Trump is going to proclaim on May the 14th, 2018, that Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel. Presidents have been recorded saying that we're going to move our embassy from Tel Aviv over to Jerusalem and thereby tell the world that Jerusalem is the capital city of Israel and no other president until now has been able to fulfill that, that campaign promise. And now it is going to, matter of fact, they are going to open up the new embassy in Jerusalem in May and on May 14th, 70 years to the day. 
Only God can do that. It did not matter what the Palestinians said. It does not matter what the UN has said. It didn't matter who came against that small little tiny nation of Israel. God said the, the capital of Israel is Jerusalem. And God says it does not matter what president has not been able to. They saw the promise, but they, God help me, they could not fulfill the promise. But I have a president in office that not only saw the promise, now now the promise is being fulfilled and it's in God's time. You cannot stop what God has declared. Let that build faith in your heart today. The unbelief, the hard heartedness stopped Adam and Eve from entering, stopped Moses from entering in, stopped Saul from continuing being uh, uh, king. It stopped the Jews from entering to the promised land. But God was not stopped. What did God do? He waited until Moses died. And he raised up Joshua to replace Moses as their leader and used him to take the younger Jews into the promised land. Now, Joshua, under Moses' leadership, under his administration, jo Joshua had something in his spirit like Ruth had in her spirit, like David had in his spirit in, in Ziklag, and he said, we are well able to take the land. Caleb had something in his spirit, said, Moses, we are well able to take the land. But because Moses disobeyed God, Moses did not have the fortitude to resist the people. So that generation died off. Did God say, I'm done with Israel? No. He raised up Joshua. And he let Caleb lead the people into the promised land. And they took the land. And they're still keeping the land. God will raise up another generation if this generation does not do what God is saying. If we, the church, to this generation will only see with eyes of faith like Joshua, Caleb, Ruth, and David, then God can give us supernatural power to bring restoration to the earth and see his plan will be fulfilled through his church. But if we should allow doubt, fear, and unbelief to cause us to disobey God's spirit like the unbelieving Jews, then God will let us die off and raise up another generation. But know this, Satan is not going to stop what God has set into motion. Turn with me to Matthew 16 as I conclude this. Is this helping you? See, we got to see as God sees. If the media, if the news media is being a stumbling block to you, cut it off. If something offends you, cut it off. If something keeps you from hearing God and doing God's will, cut it off, right? Now, Matthew 16, verse 13, Jesus has come to Caesarea. <clears throat> and there he speaks with his disciples and some of the people that were following him. Let's pick it up in verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, others, uh, some say Elijah, others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you? Say that I am. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood. You didn't get this knowledge from man. Flesh and blood has re not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. <coughs> and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, the rock of revelation, who Christ is, not Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. So you have it written in red, y'all. The gates of Hades, or hell, are, is, are not going to prevail against the church advancing in the earth and doing God's word, right? Will. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, with everything in my being, I believe that God is offering the church of our generation the opportunity to take this nation for him. We have a president who is now working with the church and not against us as the last administration. Having the president's corporation 
frees us to do the things that otherwise might cost people their freedom. If you'll remember, on the last administration, there was a couple that refused, there was a bakery that refused to give a gay couple, make them their cake because it contradicted their freedom of religion and, and it, it shocked their conscience, meaning they could not do that uh, and have a clear conscience, and, and it has cost them their livelihood. That's what government against God will do to, to Christians in America when the government works against the church. But when you have a president that works in cooperation with the church, then it frees us up to do God's work, right? This is an opportunity is what I'm saying. We can look at the problems we're facing and see them as giants that, we will, de that will devour us and allow fear to cause us to disobey God in unbelief and miss our golden opportunity, or we can take the land for Jesus. I was expecting a little bit better response there. Is there faith in this room that God has given us the land and through Christ we can take it for his glory? First Samuel 17. We'll start in verse 41. You know the story. Goliath has come out and challenged the armies of Israel, and they're all shaking in their boots, including their uh, king. But David stands up, a, a young boy, and, and declares, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Pick it up in verse 41. So the Philistines came, Philistine, Goliath, came down and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before Goliath. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the, I wonder if David wrote that. <laughs> Never caught that before. <laughs> so the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. That sounds like a threat to me. What about y'all? And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Say, I mean, get this. David's, I mean, Goliath is 10 foot tall and bulletproof, got a javelin, a spear, and a shield that somebody else is carrying for him. And David's out there, a little ruddy boy, good looking, <laughs> with no sword, spear, armor bearer, or shield. And he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. When you do that, you've got all the armor you need. Then he proclaimed this. Now, Goliath already prophesied what he's going to do. Now, David's going to prophesy what his God's going to do. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give your carcass uh, carcass to the uh, of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beast of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel wow now earlier this week the Lord revealed to me what I'm about to make known to you I've never preached or heard what the Holy Spirit has given from this story today for y'all if we have faith in the faith in God that David did God will give the giants that are in our land into our hands. God will fight the battle, and we will possess the land. Now, you'll remember, here's the part that the Lord gave me. You'll remember they did not want to go in because their cities were fortified, and there were giants in the land. And they said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers, and so they saw us as grasshoppers. What, what God showed me is... That David is showing, God is showing us through David that we are well able through Christ to take the land. Not be intimidated by the giants that are in the land. Not by their threatening voices of what they're going to do to us and how we are uh, mentally ill because we hear Jesus speak to us. But we go ahead and do what God has told us to do. All the Jews had to do was heed the instructions of Joshua and Caleb and they would have well taken the land 
out of, uh, from the way the giants and then entered and possessed the land of promise. You see, it was God who put the boldness and courage in David's heart, and it was God who put the boldness and courage in Joshua and Caleb's heart to take the land. God has not forsaken this generation. He has raised up Esther's, Joshua, David's, and Ruth's that will refuse that refuse to cave in to unbelief. They have uh, they have dominion, faith, and nothing can stop them unless those who follow refuse to go under the Lord's direction. Revelation, I'm done. Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought uh, with the dragon. But they did not prevail. There's that word again. Did not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Satan did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the, the devil, the serpent, or Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who, was, who accused them before God day and night has been cast down, and they, the church, overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives to the death. Under Adam's leadership, mankind failed to fulfill God's will, of taking dominion over the earth. But just as God raised up Joshua to take the land, God raised Jesus from the dead to lead his church to take dominion over the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. There will be a generation who will do just that. Will it be ours? It's up to us. It's so awesome to know that God is, is for us, but he's with us. And as Christians, we've got to understand that so that we will have the... the uh, boldness to step out of the boat of, of comfortable being comfortable and doing God's will so that we can take this land no matter what nation you're living in no matter what city or town or village you may be uh, living in God is there with you he's for you and he wants you to change the world through your life through your testimony that's how we overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb the word of our testimony loving not our lives to the death we've got to love God more than anything or anyone else that way we can do what God's called us to do. You're a part of what God is doing through this ministry. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of it. Thank you for praying for us as we pray for you. If you have any prayer requests or prayer supports, please send those in. And also, if you'd love to stand with us financially, uh, you can donate to us safely and securely on whcnorth.org or on our GiveLify app. You can find that on Android Store or your iPhone Store, or you can go on our website and donate there as well. And all proceeds from our television ministry go straight into that to get editing done, production, and airtime so that we can continue doing what God has called us to do. So as I get ready to leave you today, I want to encourage you. Please keep your eyes on the Lord. Let him give you the light that you need to get through these dark times. God bless you. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 